Okay, welcome to class, everybody. We will have a couple of interactive questions, so go ahead and launch your app and get logged in. I think that'll help things go a little faster. We are transitioning now to natural convection or free convection, which is chapter nine. So that means we've wrapped up chapter seven on external convection and chapter eight on internal convection. So now we're talking about free or natural convection, which I think you got a little bit of exposure to with the lab projects this week, and hopefully you're starting to think about that as a concept. Yeah, Ivan? We'll still have homework next week, yeah. The lab project is meant to be not overly burdensome or difficult. Um, I hope that's the case. So we'll have a homework, probably five problems. There will be another flipped problem next week. Okay, so we've got our first interactive problem, so go ahead and log in to the app with the room name there, and then your login is the last four digits of your student ID number. Okay, so, so far, you guys are starting to get familiar with this procedure of finding a Reynolds number based on the fluid velocity, plugging in that Reynolds number and the Prandtl number, and maybe some other things into a correlation to get the Neusolt number, which is, think of that as like a dimensionless heat transfer coefficient. So once you've got the Neusolt number, you back solve to get your H, your convection coefficient. So, if you remember, H is a function of the Neusolt number, Neusolt number is a function of the Reynolds number, and then the Reynolds number is a function of velocity. So if you could somehow maintain an environment with no bulk fluid motion, let's say you turn off all the air conditioning in a room, you minimize any movement in there, and you really just have this um, quiescent fluid that's just not moving, then because the fluid is no longer moving, you would only have conduction heat transfer and no convection heat transfer. Is that true or false? And by conduction, I mean instead of, because there's no bulk fluid blowing past your surface to sort of sweep that heat away, your, your surface is just sitting in air or some fluid, and so it's actually conducting from the surface into that fluid. Okay, so let's see how we're doing. Okay, so I worded that question in a tricky way. <laughs> so about two thirds of the class, now we're getting the cheaters. Um, most of you said that true, that you would only have conductive heat transfer because you no longer have this bulk fluid motion. And so that question was asked in a tricky way kind of by design. Um, so the thing with convective heat transfer, actually, okay, so in convect, I mean, in, sorry, in free convection, you actually induce motion of the fluid because of uneven heating of the fluid. So the surface itself would start to conduct with the fluid adjacent to it, but once that fluid starts to get warmer, starts to get warmer, its density will change. And so when its density changes, it's going to want to move. So um, those are called buoyancy forces. When you get a fluid that changes in density because of a temperature gradient, then it's going to, to move. So um, you can have stable and unstable temperature gradients. So let's just think about having a tank or some kind of column of fluid. And if you have fluid that is um, warmer, on the bottom and fluid that is colder on top, well that warmer fluid on the bottom is going to be less dense, so it's going to want to circulate up here. Similarly, that colder fluid is gonna to wanna to circulate back down to the bottom. So by inducing um, uneven heating, you're actually gonna start having flow happen. So while there's nothing external, there's no bulk velocity, there's nothing external that's flowing through your system, just having, um, these temperature and density gradients start to induce this fluid motion, which is where free or natural convection comes from. So, so this would be the unstable condition here, and here this is gonna be stable, where you have warm fluid sitting on top of cold fluid, and it'll 
more or less just kind of sit there. There will still be some diffusion and conduction and things happening, but that's a much more stable condition if, you're, if your temperature gradient goes the opposite way. Okay, any questions there? So in the lab project that you've done this week, I think the timing has worked out kind of nicely. You've compared, you, you have that rod that is sitting out in the air and it's being cooled by the air. So you did one, um, one part of the experiment was just leaving the rod sitting out in ambient air. And then the, in the other version you have this forced air. So you actually are comparing the difference between natural or free convection and then forced convection. And we'll talk a little bit more how you do calculations for natural convection. Okay, so this concept actually is, it's kind of found its way into research where people are actually trying to store energy this way. So there's something called thermal energy storage. I actually do some research in this area um, where you actually store energy. So thermal energy storage means storing energy as heat or as cooling and in order to prevent having to buy two big tanks, one to store a hot fluid and one to store a cold fluid, they actually just have one tank and you separate that tank by something called a thermocline. So you'd put the colder and more dense fluid on the bottom and the warmer and less dense fluid on the top. So then to store energy, take that colder fluid from the bottom, put that through a heat source. So this could be solar energy. So you could have some kind of solar collector array that heats up your fluid. And then to store it, you bring it back into the top. Then you would have this warm fluid and you take that warm fluid and use it to heat up a building or to drive a power generation cycle. And then you, once that, once the heat has been used, then you return that colder fluid back to the bottom of the tank. So um, when your thermocline gets inverted and if you inadvertently put this colder fluid on top of the warmer fluid, you would see this circulation start to happen and you would essentially see that um, those two fluids start to mix because that's an unstable condition. Okay, so while this is an interesting research topic, realistically, just thinking about this as engineers and using your intuition, do you think this concept would actually be something that works? Trying to store energy, separating the two fluids um, by a temperature gradient. So you should be able to answer that in the app. All right, let's see how we did. Okay, so majority said no, a big chunk of you said yes. Does anyone, let's go with someone who said no, they don't think this would work, explain why they don't think it would work. Kyle? Okay, so Kyle is saying, yeah, you're gonna have, you're still gonna have heat transfer happening in the tank, which is correct. So heat transfer is driven by a temperature gradient. So if you left your fluids in there, you would still have heat transfer happening from here down to here, that's correct. So over time, that temperature gradient would wash itself out. Anyone else wanna say anything? Okay, Blaine's saying it just seems very impractical. It is, and it's kind of a weird thing to wrap your head around. Um, Okay, so would this actually work? The answer is a resounding yes, it does actually work, and it's not just a crazy research topic, actually. Does anyone, does that look familiar to anyone? So where is that? Yeah, just uh, 70 yards from here. Um, so it looks like a fancy building or UFO or something. So that's actually, the, the cylindrical looking building is actually a thermal energy storage tank. So that, um, and you're only really seeing about the top third of it. The other two thirds of it is underground. So that's actually a very economical thing. We use this on our campus to help save money here. And I'll explain how. Um, 
So this is actually a cold thermal energy storage tank. So there's a, an interesting thing with the electric grid uh, where, I mean, you guys, when you plug in something, when you turn on the light, you just expect energy to just be there all the time, right? It's actually a really, really complex thing to manage. So at any given time, so if we turned off the lights in this room, we are actually putting a less load on some power plant somewhere um, tens or even hundreds of miles away from here. And while the, the lights in this room would be pretty negligible, physically that power plant is actually, has to suddenly change how much power it's producing and that happens pretty much instantaneously. So it's a really hot topic to try and find ways to have storage on the grid. So solar energy and wind energy are are intermittent and variable, so those make it extremely difficult to manage the whole electric grid because there's storing electrons is actually pr pretty difficult. So batteries are a really hot topic for research now. Um, you could actually, J Jason, could you hold up your thermos there? Okay, so in that guy, that looks like an expensive one, but <laughs> so, um, you can actually store as much energy in that thermos and as, as much thermal energy as you would in like a laptop battery. So it, you can store thermal energy on the order of about 100 times cheaper than in a battery, so much cheaper. So the way our campus does this is we actually, because of this fluctuating supply and demand on the electric grid, energy prices are actually lower at night when it's colder and people aren't using air conditioning and people are sleeping so they don't have lights and TVs and things turned on. So our campus physically, I mean, has an actual contract that says we pay less for energy at night than we do during the day. So because of that rate structure, they actually run a bunch of chillers at night. So they run these chillers, those chillers produce chilled water and it, they produce it at about three degrees Celsius, so just barely above freezing. And then they store it in this big tank and then the following day, they have all this stored energy and they have a much less consumption of electricity because they're able to store energy this way. And they physically, that thermocline concept is actually what they do here. So they're, um, to Kyle's point about heat transfer happening, so at the top and the bottom of the tank, there's something called a flow diffuser. So you have a big pipe coming in, but then that fluid is all separated out into a series of concentric rings, which are, are pipes. So each of those pipes are gonna have little nozzles and they try to spread this fluid out so you eliminate like jets and things that would disrupt the thermocline and mix the tank up. So they try really hard to keep everything, um, to keep anything from like, like turbulent flow. You wouldn't want anything to disrupt what's happening in the tank and you get this nice even flow of fluid down. There still would be conduction happening, but that doesn't happen on an order fast enough to um, to mess things up because this is just overnight storage. If you tried to store energy like this over a much longer period, yeah, eventually the tank is gonna, um, all that heat transfer will occur and this thing will reach a thermal equilibrium. Okay. Okay, another, this isn't an interactive question, even though I, <laughs> Ignore the text on the bottom. So first of all, why would you even care about trying to separate your hot fluid from your cold fluid? Wouldn't a well-mixed tank store the same amount of energy? Yeah, James? Great, okay, so it's about usable energy, perfect. Um, want to elaborate or anyone else want to elaborate? So you guys have heard of entropy, right? So when, when the tank would mix, while it might have the same amount of energy, you would actually be generating a bunch of entropy. The inverse of entropy is something called exergy. So exergy, to James's point, is um, basically usable energy. So energy is always conserved, but ex something like exergy or entropy can be created and destroyed. So you actually destroy exergy, the amount of usable energy. So from a heat transfer point of view, when these guys, they want to keep that cold fluid separated from the hot fluid because ultimately they're going to take that cold fluid, pump it out to buildings, including this one. So they're going to take this chilled water and pump it to a building. When it gets to the building, you're going to have a heat exchanger. So you're going to blow air past these chilled water coils and you're going to need that air to get cold and come into the building. So you're 
your delta t there, we've talked about delta t as a driving force. You wanna have as high of a delta t as you can so that energy is gonna be transferred as efficiently as possible. So if you mix the whole tank and it all just became lukewarm, you'd have really horrible delta t's and you'd have to pump a lot more fluid in order to get the same amount of heat. Any questions there? Okay, so this is actually results from a research paper studying thermocline thermal energy storage. This was a paper that I wrote when I was in graduate school actually. So if there's no turbulence or if you're able to avoid in temperature inversions, you can actually maintain the stratification for several days. So a stratified tank um, under the same conditions would store the same amount of energy, but you maintain your exergy. So, um, you'll store more exergy, you'll have more useful energy to use. So the bigger delta T you have, the better heat transfer properties you're gonna get. And you'll learn this when, you, when we talk about heat exchangers especially. You want that delta T, that driving force, so you can effectively heat or cool a fluid, whatever you're trying to do. Oh, and actually, so th these results were pretty interesting, so I'll just elaborate. So this is the same type of application, this is for a hospital in Texas. So these are, this is the normalized temperature. So they're keeping the flow. So this is the flow that is going out to cool all the buildings. So there's some disruption on this particular day that happens and they have this surge in flow. So that surge in flow going out to all the buildings, it comes back at a lower temperature than normal. So they, so that surge in flow corresponds with this lower temperature and what happened in this particular case was exactly that temperature inversion where you got a bunch of cold fluid on top of hot fluid and that caused it to mix. Okay, so, <clears throat> so far I'm just trying to get you familiar with this notion of buoyancy and having buoyancy induces flow and inducing flow makes convection start to happen. So you get this fluid flowing against a solid and it might not be forced from a pump or a fan or the wind or something it might just be all internal where the temperature gradients themselves are inducing this flow. So when you have a solid, that's the source of heat or cold, that's gonna create buoyancy currents. There's gonna be a temperature gradient which will create a density gradient and that density gradient will lead to the fluid flowing and then convection still happens. Okay, so now let's get into some of the implications from class. So free boundary flows occur when a, um, when a quiescent fluid or a motionless fluid um, comes in, in touch with a heated or a cooled surface and that makes this flow start to happen. So you get, we still have this same concept of boundary layers just like we did in forced convection, but now instead of a forced flow, it's going to be this buoyancy flow that happens. So this is the same, um, kind of a thing that works for smokestacks and you're like a chimney in your house. So you have, you have a heat source here, so you're burning something or you're exhausting heat for some other reason. So what happens here is you get this heat source means that this fluid is less dense. So this less dense fluid that's hotter is gonna want to start to make its way upward. Once that happens, um, you get all the fluid is going up this way so it creates a vacuum and then you're gonna want um, something from the ambient to rush in to replace that fluid and that buoyancy effect is entirely what makes this whole thing happen. So you do this like if you have a gas or a wood burning fireplace in your house, you rely on this uh, stack effect to help keep all the um, combustion gases from coming back into your house. You wanna create this nice flow that's removing all the nasty combustion products and forcing them to go outside and up the stack. Okay, so in where we've typically dealt with Reynolds number, if you remember in forced convection from chapter seven and eight, the Reynolds number is a function of the fluid velocity and that fluid velocity is like the velocity through a pipe or it's the bulk fluid velocity when you have external flow. So now we no longer have this bulk fluid velocity so we have to use different dimensionless numbers and I, I don't particularly care that you commit these to memory, but these are the guys that you'll have to use to look up your convection coefficients and to look up the correlations for your convection coefficients. So the first of these dimensionless numbers is called the Grayshoff number. So that's the ratio of buoyancy force 
divided by viscous force. So that buoyancy force is a function of gravity. It's also a function of beta, or beta is the thermal expansion coefficient of a fluid. So beta is something you could look up in a textbook, actually the textbook for this class, to find, that's a thermodynamic property of the fluid. You could say, how much is the density of that fluid going to change if I heat it up by X number of degrees? That's basically what beta means. Then we're gonna have our temperature difference, so our surface temperature minus the bulk temperature. Our characteristic length is going to be in there somehow, and this will be different depending on the surface geometry. So it might be a pipe where L is going to be the pipe diameter, or it might be a flat plate where L is the length of the plate. And as we've experienced before with forced convection, you're gonna have a different correlation coefficient, I mean, a different correlation to get the new salt number depending on the surface geometry. Another dimensionless number that will show up as we do these calculations is called the Rayleigh number. So the Rayleigh number is just the Grayshoff number multiplied by the Prandtl number, where again, the Prandtl number is just a characteristic of the fluid that again you can look up in a book or online. Okay, so often you'll have some combination of forced convection and free convection. You might have both of those things happening at the same time. So you can use, there's a rule of thumb that you can use to determine which one is more important and which correlations do you use. So the, that correlation is going to be, or that rule of thumb is gonna be you take the Grayshoff number from here and you divide that by the Reynolds number squared. So in this case, you, because it would be a mixed condition, you're taking the Grayshoff number that would help us characterize natural convection combined with the Reynolds number, so there would be a fluid velocity in these particular cases. And if, if that ratio is approximately one, then you need to account for both free and forced convection. However, if, the Grayshoff, if that ratio is much, much greater than one, so your Grayshoff number is much, much greater than the square of your Reynolds number, then it's a safe assumption to only focus on free convection and neglect forced convection. And similarly, if the opposite is true, if the Grayshoff number is really small and the Reynolds number is really big, then you would just focus on forced convection and you would neglect free convection. So, um, any questions so far? Yeah, Juan? Okay, uh, so Juan is saying, what if it's like 1.2 or if it's two? What do you guys think? I would go with a combination there. So notice the, the double greater than sign. So if it's much, much greater, like if that ratio is 100, then that's probably safe. But if it's like two or even maybe 10, you might wanna factor in both things. Great, good question. So when you guys did the free convection or the natural convection part of your experiment in the, in the lab this week, would you what do you think that ratio would be in this particular, in that particular case? So the, when you're doing that experiment, when you had the rod that's cooling with no fan there to have forced convection, so free convection, okay. Do you think you'd factor in forced convection at all? So I think if you, if you actually, were eventually later in this lecture, we're gonna get to correlations that would help you describe free convection. I think if you applied those correlations to that exact system, I think you would find that free, the free convection correlation would grossly underpredict the actual heat transfer coefficient that you observed. And the reason I say that is because you were in a room that has active ventilation and there's people around, and so there, there are external things happening. It's actually quite difficult to maintain a truly um, quiescent <laughs> atmosphere. So you'd probably wanna factor in even a little bit of forced convection into that equation if you could, although it's, so there's gonna be things circulating. So in that case, it's gonna be hard to actually measure a, a velocity, but I think you'd find that just using purely free convection would underestimate your H value. So when you do have this mixed condition, the methodology would be to 
calculate the new salt number for free convection and calculate the new salt number for natural convection. That's this NC here. And then you would apply this other rule of thumb, which is just an empirically observed relationship and notice the approximate signs. So sometimes you'll find that free convection and forced convection are working together and sometimes you'll find that they're working against each other. So you have to think through, are they, is forced convection helping free convection or are they fighting against each other? So depending on if they're helping each other or hurting each other, you'd use a plus or a minus. So for assisting and transverse flows, you would use a plus sign here. And if they're opposing flows, you would use a minus sign. So if the, um, if the buoyancy forces are pushing your fluid upward and that's combined with an upward flow, then you would use a plus sign. Um, if the buoyancy forces are pushing fluid downward and that's going against an upward flow, then you'd use a minus sign. And that the coefficient that you would use here would be approximately three. So we're getting a little bit hand wavy here. This is a definitely a rough rule of thumb to use. Oh, n is the exponent that you would use in this relationship here. So you would, yeah, good question. Thanks for pointing that out. So I would, if I were trying to calculate forced convection and free convection, let's say they were assisting each other, I'd calculate each new salt number, raise them to the third power, add them together, and then um, take the cubed root to get my effective new salt number, which would be the combination of forced convection and natural convection. And if you haven't already noticed, I'm using the terms natural convection and free convection interchangeably because they basically mean the same thing. Okay, so here is how this would work. So if we have a hot plate, so first we're gonna look at vertical plates. Um, so if I have a hot plate in that's hotter than ambient, so that hot plate is going to, first it's going to conduct energy into the fluid immediately adjacent to it. Once that fluid starts heating up though, now it's less dense than the surrounding fluid and it'll start flowing upward. So you still get velocity boundary layers that would look something like this. And that upward flow is gonna be partially balanced out by a no slip condition still at the wall. But then you'd also start to see this temperature boundary layer form here. So we still have to deal with boundary layers. We'll get to a point where these end up being like empirical correlations and it's go find the equation and more plug and chug. So if this plate were cold, and the surface temperature were less than ambient, how would the conditions here change? How would the fluid direction change? If the, if the plate was, were cold instead of hot, what, how does this change the scenario? So it, it would flip it, yeah, the flow. So if the plate were cold, this colder plate would, there would be conduction happening into this fluid, then that fluid would get colder, so it would become more dense, and it would start going downward. So these would both be inverted in that case. And we'll find that there are actually different correlations based on whether the surface is hot or cold relative to ambient. So just like in forced convection, it's, things get really hairy and really complicated. When you have a hot surface, and I guess, um, yeah, when you have a hot surface, that's gonna heat up the fluid next to it, and for the vast majority of fluids, that's gonna cause the fluid to become hotter and less dense, so that would induce an upward flow. Whereas a cold surface, it's gonna cool the fluid, which would make it more dense, and that's gonna induce a downward flow. Does that make sense? So you just gotta think about, is that surface, is it hotter or colder than ambient, and is that gonna make my, the air immediately, or the, the fluid immediately adjacent to it, more, more dense or less dense? Oh, so Ivan's asking, say that again, does it go? Yeah. 
so Ivan's asking, does that keep going down the plate or does it circulate back? Is that? It depends on the rest of your system. So that's a complicated question to ask, but we'll, you'll find these correlations are set up for a really, really simplistic scenario. So really in this particular example, let's stick with the hot plate example. You're just assuming this keeps going up and then it's, yeah, you're not really worried about what's happening at the end of this, I guess. Um, if you did know and if you were concerned about something, you just have to analyze those other parts of your system and treat the thing very holistically. But right now we'll just focus on keeping things simple and showing you the correlations for that particular example. Okay, so like in forced convection, there's a lot going on. You have a moving fluid, which means you've got to do a, um, you've got to do a momentum balance. You'd couple that with an energy balance. So now you have these two different PDEs that are coupled and you have to solve them. And that gets really, really complicated and that solving those is completely outside of the scope of this class. So we'll just stick, we'll just go straight to the correlations that happen here. So just like in forced convection, you're gonna have to analyze the geometry of your system, analyze the fluid properties. In this case, we'll be using the Grashof number and the Rayleigh number instead of the Reynolds number. But the procedure is basically the same. We'll have a new salt number correlation. That's a function of um, ultimately the temperature gradient. And we'll take that new salt number to solve for H. So when you have a vertical plate, the correlation looks like this. So you have the Grashof number over four taken to the one fourth power. That's multiplied by this G function. This isn't the gravitational constant. Our textbook has a really unfortunate choice of variables here. This G parameter is defined as this. So you basically just take this whole guy and substitute it in here. So that's the basic correlation to get the new salt number for um, when you have a vertical plate subject to natural convection. There, we still have to deal with laminar or turbulent, except now we're going to determine laminar or turbulent flow as a function of the Rayleigh number instead of the Reynolds number. So the Rayleigh number, as we defined previously, looks like this. So if you get a, Ray, a Rayleigh number of 10 billion, no, I guess 1 billion or more, that would say that your flow is turbulent. Otherwise, it's going to be laminar. So these are some of the, the, some of the equations you can use. So when you have laminar flow and you know that your Rayleigh number is less than a billion, less than 10 to the ninth, um, you would use this correlation. So this gives us our average new salt number over the whole plate as a function of Rayleigh number. And if the flow is turbulent, you would use this guy, but this guy would also apply to the laminar case. So again, it's just calculating those numbers and then plugging and chugging to get your average new salt number, which you then use that back solve the definition of the new salt number to get your H. So here are the relationships for horizontal plates. So a horizontal plate is a little bit different. You have, we're gonna have different correlations based on <clears throat> whether we're analyzing heat transfer on the top of the plate or the bottom of the plate. So if you have a hot surface facing upward, so here we have a hot surface, which means it's gonna heat up the air immediately adjacent to it. And then that air is gonna wanna start going upward and it's gonna create a pretty complex condition where there's gonna have to be some other kind of air that comes in to replace it. That may come from the sides or it may come downward. Um, but a similar phenomenon happens when you have a cold surface facing downward. That colder fluid is gonna to want to go down. So we actually use in either of these cases a hot surface facing upward or a cold surface facing downward. You would use the same correlations which look like this. And these are a uh, function of Rayleigh number. So Rayleigh numbers between 10 to the fourth and 10 to the seventh, you'd use this guy. And otherwise, if they're higher than that, you'd use this guy. Super fun material. So you actually use a different correlation when you, if, so now if you have a hot surface facing downward, this is quite different what happens physically. So now you're heating this fluid here, which is going to want to make it more buoyant, less dense. So now, but that fluid is gonna have to go out and around the plate. Similarly for a cold surface, um, that cold plate is gonna heat this, is gonna cool this fluid, sorry, and that fluid is gonna have to go around and down. So you use a different correlation because the 
fundamental fluid flows are quite different. Yeah, James? If you had a sealed system? Yeah, if, there were, if the system were enclosed, if there were something else happening, the, the analysis becomes much more complex. And it's, I would imagine it's a lot harder to come up with kind of ubiquitous correlations in that particular case. So you'd have to do some much more complex like CFD modeling or something. Okay, so another geometry that we'll encounter is this a long horizontal cylinder. When it says long, it basically means you're assuming everything's constant in the uh, going in and out of the board, so that transverse direction, and you're really just focusing on what's happening in cross flow around the cylinder. So here you'd get an average new salt number, which is going to be a function of the <coughs> Rayleigh number, and you would, whoever did the experiments and came up with this correlation, only validated these experiments for Rayleigh numbers less than 10 to the 12th. So Again, these are just correlations usually arrived at by experimentation, but they tend to be um, transferable from fluid to fluid, and that's because they try to put everything in terms of the new silt number, which is like a dimensionless heat transfer coefficient. Okay, so this is the, we're gonna do an example problem before we go. I want you guys to help me think through this problem first. Okay, so we have an uninsulated steam pipe with an outer diameter of 20 centimeters. It passes through a large warehouse space near the ceiling. So the outer surface temperature of the pipe is at 150 degrees C, and the pipe is exposed to the building's downward air conditioning flow, approximated to be uniform at 20 degrees Celsius. It is determined that both free and forced convection heat transfer are important. So we have an average new salt number of 10.2 for the free convection and an average new salt number of 20.1 for the forced convection. So we want to approximate the heat loss per unit length of the pipe. And then we're given some fluid conditions. Okay, so let's try to set this problem up. So this is where it's important to try and think through the problem and what's physically happening and make sure that you understand the concept of what's going on. So we've got some kind of ceiling here, we have this fluid flow going downward. So this is colder fluid flow. Then here we've got this pipe that's carrying steam. Um, so it's got this surface temperature of 150 degrees C. And we wanna know how much heat that pipe is losing. So this actually might be an interesting um, energy saving type calculation where you wanna figure out, well, how much energy and money am I losing because of all this heat loss? Do I want to insulate this pipe or not? Okay, so we're given a new salt number for forced convection. We're also given a new salt number for free convection. So that's a kind of a shortcut to this problem. Normally, you'd have to go calculate your Reynolds number in the forced case and use that to calculate a new salt number. And in the free convection case, you'd have to calculate your Rayleigh number and use the appropriate correlation. But we've skipped those steps and we're just dealing with new silt numbers. So what's the first step here? Okay, find the average new silt number. How would we go about finding the average new silt number? Say that again. Great. Alex is saying we need to cube the new salt numbers, then add or subtract them. So it's not really an average new salt number, it's an effective new salt number because you don't just take a simple arithmetic average here, you have to use that cubic relationship. Okay, so that relationship was our new salt number, so our effective new salt number to the third power is approximately equal to our new salt number and we're just dealing with averages here. Our new silt number for forced convection to the third power plus or minus our new silt number for natural convection to the third power. Okay, so we've got it, right? Yeah, just we do plus or minus and we just come up with two separate answers and hope that one of them is right. 
So, okay, so we still gotta figure out is this plus or minus. So how do we determine if it's plus or minus? Okay, when the flow is assisting or opposing. So are forced and free working together or are they working against each other? So what do you think? And I should point out that the ambient air coming down is at 20 degrees C. So do we use plus or minus here? Kyle saying minus, anyone say plus? So how, how do we know that it's minus or why do we think that it's minus here? Okay, so James is making some good hand motions. So we have fluid forced convection is happening in this direction going downward, but our natural convection, so we have this hot pipe this hot pipe is going to encounter this air around it. And as it encounters that air around it, it's going to heat it up, which will make it less dense and more buoyant, and that'll make it want to flow up and out. So we have natural convection is going upward, and then we have our forced convection is going downward. So they're working against each other. Yeah, Blaine? Okay, so Blaine is um, talking about heat exchangers. So in heat exchangers, we'll talk about this in chapter 11 very soon. Um, so this is actually not a heat exchanger though. This is a pipe. So in a heat exchanger, you physically separate the two fluids. They're in two different channels. Whereas here, they're, it's just the same air. So you'd actually get like intermixing here and there's gonna be a kind of a lot of stuff going on here. So. Okay. I'd suggest waiting until we talk about heat exchangers to fill that out. So in this particular case, we have these two, the two fluids are working against each other. So that would result in an, a smaller velocity effectively of the air, which means we'll have a lower heat transfer coefficient. So in this particular case, we're gonna take the minus here. So that would mean, so our, new sol our effective new salt number there, okay. So that's going to be equal to 20.1, which was our forced convection new salt number, um, minus 10.2 cubed, and we take that quantity to the one third power, and we end up with an effective new salt number of 19.2. So you'd still expect the new salt number to be somewhere in between, but because of this, because of the cubic nature of it, you'll find that it's, that forced convection still kind of dominates in this case. So our effective new salt number correlation is still very close to the forced convection um, in this case. However, if, we, if they were working together, we would have a plus sign here and the effective new salt number would be bigger than either of the individual new salt numbers. Okay, so now we wanna calculate the, we have a new salt number, we actually wanna calculate how much heat is being lost, which is something we would actually care about and could put into like normal human terms. So how do we go from having a new salt number to having a total rate of heat loss? So we'd, we take our new salt number and we're gonna wanna calculate our convective heat transfer coefficient. So now our H bar is equal to our effective new salt number that we just calculated. Sorry, my handwriting's terrible. Times K, which was given in the problem, divided by D. So that, I'm gonna skip the plug and chug part. You do the math here, that ends up being 2.52 watts per meter squared Kelvin, and then you just apply Newton's law of cooling. So in this particular case, our heat loss per unit length is going to be equal to H times the perimeter of the pipe, times the surface temperature of the pipe, which was that 150 degrees C, minus our air temperature of 20 degrees C, 
So doing the math, we end up losing about 206.0 watts per meter. Any questions there? So can someone explain that form of Newton's law of cooling before? We've seen the flux version, where the flux is equal to H times delta T. We've seen the energy version, where energy is equal to H times A times delta T. This one's a little bit different. Is that, that form of it makes sense to everyone, though? So we're basically taking the total heat loss and dividing it by the length of the pipe, so we'd get heat loss per unit length. So dividing it by the length would also take out the L term where area would equal P times L, so we're left with just P. Okay, any questions there on natural convection? That's our last slide, so we're gonna leave a little bit early today. Um, yeah, that wraps up chapter nine. If it helps, um, natural convection gets really complicated. You're gonna have a couple of homework problems, but it's not gonna be a major area of focus in this class. All right, thanks everybody. Have a good weekend.